from the beginning. History of lighting. Our story. Well, any, any of you that know us, we're Catalyst Sales and Marketing. We're a local agent here in Atlantic Canada, and we connect global manufacturers to local markets. Uh, just a quick rundown on the agenda here. We're going to go through pre-electric lighting, early 1800s, mid to late 1800s, early 20th century, mid 20th century, and mid to late 20th century. And we're going to finish up in the late 80s, early 90s. I'm, I purposefully left out uh, early 21st century because we're in it right now. We're living it. Uh, most of us that are on the call have seen the inception of LED and how it's now starting to affect trend and design. And if you have interest in that, then you can join us here uh, next week uh, in design trends. And I'll talk about that following uh, this presentation. So pre-electric lighting, ancient history through the 19th century. Light is life. If we have darkness, we have nothing. So it'd be a pretty cold spot. We'd just be a, a big floating chunk of ice if we didn't have that sun. And this is uh, Mark and I on a sales meeting here back in February before things broke out. No, just joking. So we're looking here at around 125,000 BC. And this is roughly when the control of fire by early humans uh, became relevant. It was a turning point in the evolution and fire provided a couple things before these early humans it provided warmth it provided protection from predators uh, and it also helped them to create better hunting tools and a method for cooking food these advances also allowed them to move around easier so that includes geographic dispersal the cultural innovations and changes to diet and behavior and additionally, this creation of fire, it allowed humans to continue things in the dark and also colder hours of the evening. So right around 70,000 BC, early humans would then take hollowed out pieces of material, typically rock, or they would find a hollowed out area. They would fill it with a moss or similar material that was soaked in animal fat, and they would ignite that. Here we see some primitive lamps. These are ice age lamps. And these were used to control fire, move it around. Uh, they could carry it with them, right? They could carry some animal, animal fat with them. They could carry this lamp and they could get a fire going relatively, you know, uh, simple uh, wherever they happen to be. You can see some variation in form, material, and design, and, and, but no real clear progression from crude to elaborate in this stage. Uh, the various forms of lamps most likely represent functional responses to particular use. Uh, that made them, again, simple, easily carved, and some you can see here on the bottom where they've got, you know, uh, a, a carving of something on the bottom. Uh, here's another couple of pieces here, uh, stones where they actually ground out or hollowed the center. Ancient cave art. This is a picture from southern France where there happens to be many, many, like over a hundred uh, discovered digs and caves where they found these prints. And archaeologists presume that the creation of these paintings and engravings, you know, hundreds of meters underground, must have required an artificial light source. This is uh, one of my favorites that I was able to find. And it's the first known inception of decoration and personalization, which is important. And here we see uh, the ibex scribed on the back of this lamp. Uh, it's also fabricated in a way that one side of it's rounded to serve as a handle. It comes out to a point. Oil lamps start to come into play around 4500 BC. And you see on the left, we've got an open design. And on the right, uh, this Egyptian oil lamp, this is a wicked lamp. So designs changed to a wick design. 
uh, and they were commonly made from these lamps. They were commonly made from terracotta, bronze, stone, and alabaster. And production likely moved from a pottery wheel to a mold. And moving to a mold gave better quality, so it was consistent every time they made the piece. And it also allowed them to put set into the mold decoration, so they could make a lot and make them the same uh, and add decorations to these. I'll also mention at around 3000 BC, the early Egyptians started to use a crude version of the candle. And they made these candles by using, uh, they call them rush lights. And basically they were made by, they'd take the soaky, or sorry, the, the pilfy core of reeds and they'd soak them in animal fat. However, these rush lights, they didn't have a wick like a true candle. Here we see the first mass produced lamps in history. These are found in Egypt, Greece, and Rome, but also China, Japan, India, Iran, Kuwait. I'll also bring up, these are some Roman pieces and the Romans, they brought the lamps to Europe and that preserved the importance of ceremony and the precedent of the ancient Egyptians in Greek. The Romans are credited with developing the first wick candle around 500 BC. And historians say other civilizations had wick candles uh, at a similar time. And they made the waxes using, you know, plants and insects that were available. Early Chinese candles were said to have been molded in uh, paper tubes using rolled rice paper for the wick and wax from indigenous insects. Uh, in Japan, candles were made of wax extracted from tree nuts. And in India, candle wax was made by boiling the fruit of the cinnamon tree. Another important role that candles played was in religious ceremonies. Uh, Hanukkah, the Jewish festival of lights, it's centered on the lighting of candles, and it dates back to 165 BC. And there's also several biblical references to candles. The Emperor Constantine is reported to have called for the use of candles during an Easter service in the fourth century. And here we see uh, splinter and rush light holders from the Middle Ages. So if you were a peasant in England uh, in the Middle Ages, this is how you lit your cave, hut, house. Candles were expensive uh, in the day and England didn't have resinous trees that they could make wax from. So they used these rush lights. Uh, the rush gets cut, soaked, stripped, dried, and then they dripped uh, fat over it or they soaked it in fat and then dried it again. Here we see one of the first candle holders, uh, you know, they, they basically furnished it to uh, a ceiling mounted unit and they called it a chandelier. So most early Western cultures relied primarily on candles and they rendered that from animal fat. A major improvement came during the Middle Ages when beeswax candles were introduced. Unlike animal fat, uh, beeswax burned pure, clean, it didn't have a smoky flame, and it, they smelt much better than the odor of tallow. Uh, this beeswax, they were widely used in the church and ceremonies, but they were expensive. So few individuals other than wealthy could afford to burn them in their home. Uh, fun fact, if you, if, uh, if you know anyone with the last name Chandler, uh, Chandlers were known as people that went door to door in England and France uh, at the time and they made candles, these chandlers, they made candles. And what you would do at the time, you would save all the animal fat that you got from cooking, you would save that and the chandler would come around and he'd make your candles out of the fat you saved for him. Here we see reproductions of these middle-aged candle holders or chandeliers. And here we have right around the, the 1400s, okay, and you see in this portrait, 
what are we looking at? Well, look at how ornate these chandeliers are becoming. I'm just going to back the slide up. So, oh, sorry. Here's this, you know, Middle Ages, very rough and crude. And then we start to see, you know, trades coming into play. And the wealthy wanted to use these. These were, you know, basically eye candy in open spaces within their homes, palaces, uh, public spaces. And that's, you begin to see this opulence. Uh, a fun fact I, I found on uh, public illumination, as far back as the 1400s uh, in London, they were ordained to hang lanterns out on winter evenings. In Paris, the first order was issued in 1524 uh, that any home with windows that face the street, you had to have a lantern on. In the 16, mid 1600s, uh, lanterns were also required to be out every night. And in the early 1700s, if you didn't have lanterns on between 6 and 11 on your home, especially if you were on a street or pathway, you could get a fine. Here we see some beautiful crystal chandeliers in Versailles in France. This is 17th century. Uh, one interesting thing that happened during this time is that the glass making got better. So in the 17th century, the discovery of adding lead oxide to glass made it clearer and easier to produce, right? And I'll also back this up. I'll give a nod to the early Egyptians and they were the ones who got into glass making. So it had been around for a long time, thousands of years, but it really came on when this discovery of adding the lead oxide was made. Here's another piece, right? We can see here a gilded piece. This is an eight lighter. Another style, Dutch, double tiered. Here we see an early American interior. And this one I'll also mention, you know, when you came to the Americas, Europe had all the facilities, the factories, the tradespeople. In the Americas, we didn't have any of that. So you were seeing chandeliers furnished with tin, the materials that they had available at the time, woods, spun wood. Here's an iron and wood one. This Baroque style bronze and brass example manufactured in 1845 by Archer and Werner, one of the leading chandelier manufacturers in Philadelphia. So you can see how it progressed, right? From mid 18s up to mid 19. Now we're gonna to go to mid to late 1800s. And what we're looking at here, you know, we're gonna focus on the gas lighting, gas lighting for a few minutes now. And overall, American gas fixtures ranged from lavishly elegant to starkly plain. This example shows an exhibit from Mechanics Hall in Boston, uh, 18, dated 1878. So when we think of gaslighting, I mean, it's all but forgotten now. The, the last gaslight I think I saw was a, a, a kerosene lamp at a cabin. But in the day between, you know, the early 1800s right up to the early 1900s, gaslighting was as popular in cities anyway as electrical lighting is today. So it was their normal to have gaslighting. Uh, fun fact. The largest gas lighting network in the world today is in Berlin, and they have about 37,000 lamps uh, still working as gas street lamps, and that's the most in the world. Uh, another neat fact I found, uh, there are Chinese records dating back 1,700 years uh, using natural gas, and they were plumbing it to homes using bamboo pipes, which is, just, I find that crazy. 
So here we see the print on the left, the uh, factory of Cornelius Baker. On the right, what's interesting about this print is they began to make chandeliers, gas chandeliers that looked like candle chandeliers. So these candles were actually hollowed up the center and they had combustible flame coming out the top, right? So they'd be plumbed from the ceiling down. If you have interest and you live in Atlanta, Canada, and you have some, uh, you know, you're looking for something to do this summer once uh, all this uh, crazy COVID stuff is lifted, uh, Minister's Island, which is just outside of St. Andrews, has still in existence a uh, full gas uh, infrastructure. Uh, so Mr. Cornelius Van Horn, he's the gentleman on the right, he was a railway tycoon and he built this cottage down in St. Andrews in the late 1800s. I've been there several times. It's a fantastic piece of history. It's, a, uh, it's protected by the federal government as a uh, heritage site. And uh, yeah, if you go down there, you, th this building would have been lit by gas uh, at that time. And a lot of the infrastructure is still there. You can see it. So looking at this stat, you know, this, uh, this piece, gas light fixtures were installed below ceiling heights and they were installed below ceiling heights for, for two reasons. One, the light it made came with a flame, so you couldn't mount it too close to the ceiling. Uh, and the bowl had to be kept a safe distance away from anything that might ignite. A second reason was that the gas to the fixture had to be turned on and off with a valve or valves. So in some cases, the fixture might be lowered. You might have a, a, you know, a stick with a, with a device on it that could turn a valve, but often it was thought about in the design. So a wall sconce may not be any higher on the wall than something you could reach with a step. The other thing that's interesting, you know, as a result, the true gaslight fixtures, most authentic reproductions are chandeliers, they're pendant lights, wall sconces, and they'll have open bowls facing upwards. They're usually made of glass and often ornate. And they were made to hold the mantle, but in modern times, they now hold a light bulb. The original fixtures that have open bowl, uh, the reason why they were open is because the combustion from the flame needed to escape. Uh, and also what the glass bowl did was it allowed the light to disperse so it gave better dispersion of the light from that flame. Here we see a page from a catalog at the time, and that showed a wide range of gas fixtures, types and styles. I'll give mention to another popular lamp at the time. This was called the Argand lamp, and uh, this was invented in 1780 by Ami Argand. And these types of lamps had a reservoir and they were gravity fed. They used whale oil, olive oil, other vegetable oils. And eventually what happened is that the, the, this technology died out because in 1850, right around 1850, kerosene lamps really started to take off. And kerosene lamps brings me to my next slide. Uh, this gentleman here, Abraham Jessner. And I felt it was important as a Atlantic Canadian to put Abe on here, because Abe was from here. Abe was born in Nova Scotia. He uh, spent most of his life, working life in New Brunswick, and he invented kerosene. Uh, so, you know, Abe here also, uh, he started a museum in St. John called the Museum of Natural History. And at the time it was the first public museum in Canada and it later became the New Brunswick Museum. And it's, it's, still, uh, it's still standing today. So Abe Jessner invented kerosene in 1846. And here's some uh, versions of kerosene lamps. Kerosene lamps are very popular. They're still very popular today. Uh, people collect them. You can go on eBay. Uh, the sales pitches at the time uh, when these were being sold 
you know, the, the sales pitches were like, you need a kerosene lamp in every, every corner of your home, you know, uh, the more opulent, the better, right? And here's some more versions. Very elegant. They use different materials, often custom. You see some bronze pieces, a lot of glass. And then we come into 1879. 1879, as a result, we've got Thomas Edison, and he introduces the first practical incandescent bulb. And it's not long before this takes right off. So from its inception to proof of concept, uh, from 1879, we see within four years, here's uh, the first electrical uh, lighting showroom in the United States, uh, Bergman and Company. And, you know, here four years later, this is in 1883, we have electrical lighting showrooms. So it didn't take long for electricity to catch on. However, it did take a while to phase out the gas. So there are a lot of fixtures we see here. They would have been also dual. So they would work with gas and they would also have an electric portion. Uh, and eventually gas faded out altogether. Early 20th century. So here, this is just a, a quick cost analysis of uh, 1,000 candle hours in various periods. We say sometimes that the cost of everything goes to zero, and we can certainly see this uh, starting at the top from these expensive uh, ways to make candles, uh, and then getting to the bottom, a tungsten filament being seven cents per 1,000 candle hours. The last part of the presentation here, we're just going to go through, you know, these early to mid and late 20th century pieces. Here we've got a Tiffany lamp. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the Tiffany lamp. But here, this water lily table lamp is one of Tiffany's most successful executed designs. And the firm was well known for leaded glass products. The design here, I mean, a lot of the designs came from nature. And you can see that in designs today, even when you look at similar manufacturers. Uh, this lamp has been widely knocked off and other styles of Tiffany. Here we see a Sears and Roebuck catalog of the time. And while Art Nouveau and arts and crafts designs were influenced during this early part of the 20th century, the lighting preferences of the mass market continued to be more traditional designs that were an extension of the Victorian designs of the late 19th century. So they still had that gas light flare. Uh, here we get into the Bohas lighting. And Bohas was a factory in Germany that had some really advanced designs for the time. And a lot of people would use style hues from them. And we have manufacturers still today, to this date, uh, that draw on these pieces from this period in time. So these are other lighting pieces from the Boas workshops. Uh, they exhibit the same modernist philosophy of design expressed with modern materials such as metal and glass. Here we have uh, Paul Edison uh, snowball lamp. This was another popular design of the time. Uh, so Paul was trained as an architect, uh, best known for this series of lighting fixtures. And fascinating, you know, a lot of these designers that came up through in the 30s and the 50s, their inspiration drew on gas. So all they had was gas lighting when they came. They didn't have electricity. So uh, the, uh, the bulb was a new medium for them to work with. Art Deco and Art Modern, 1930s. One of the major attributes of this style is an embrace of technology. It's the eclectic style that combines traditional craft motifs with machine age imagery and materials. This style is characterized by rich colors, bold geometric shapes, lavish ornamentation, and lighting fixtures of the period represent perfect examples 
of the style's character. Uh, if you've ever been to New York City, Boston, we could even go to Toronto uh, and find some old buildings from the 30s, early 40s, with these styles still working to this day. Uh, where Art Nouveau tended to be floral and elaborate with detailed line, Art Deco was bold, stark, and had simple, crisp lines. I love seeing this stuff when I do visit uh, a city like, say, Philly, uh, where they have these pieces uh, in their public buildings today. Mid 20th century. So the influence of the Bauhaus modernists, you know, it began to influence home lighting in the post-World War era. Uh, lighting fixtures from the 40s and 50s reflected sleek, simple lines of modernist design. Think, uh, you know, Jetsons. So here on the right, we see uh, a catalog. Uh, and I, 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 I really like this, this mid-century modern. Uh, my folks had some of these pieces in their home in the early 80s. Uh, here's another uh, very popular designer, uh, George Nielsen. He was a industrial designer and one of the founders of American modernism. And these uh, bubble lamps, I mean, they're highly knocked off to this day in pendants. You can see them in several catalogs of manufacturers. Uh, artichoke lamp. This was another big design when it came out. Uh, this is another guy that grew up in... Uh, Germany, uh, on, you know, under gas lighting. But the artichoke lamp came around when Mr. Hennison here was asked to design a ceiling light for a new restaurant in, in Germany in the late 50s. And the designer revisited different designs, and this is what he came up with. It's a sculpture design that accomplished two goals. Uh, it's similarity to the upside down artichoke, so coming from nature. And it's composed of 72 individual leaves. Uh, and that completely conceals the light bulb, but reflects its warm glow in every direction. This is another piece where it's drawing off of nature. Arco floor lamp, uh, designed by Achille Castelligoni in 1962. You know, think of the swing in 60s, as groovy, as elegant. The lamp's iconic status was sealed when it appeared on screen alongside Sean Connery in Diamonds Are Forever and The Italian Job. Frisbee suspension lamp. This is another design by Akil uh, in the late 70s. And this one, again, this is widely knocked off. You still see uh, inspiration in this style of pendant today. And one of the last lamps I want to visit, this one you'll all be familiar with. And when I tell you, you'll be like, right, right. So two words, Disney, Pixar. So the Tolomo was a timeless classic. And, you know, there, there's a reason why uh, the inspiration for Pixar's cute little intro. I'm sure you've seen that little lamp that, that hops around. But in 1989, uh, this lamp was awarded the Compasso d'Oro. Uh, it was an award for Italian industrial design. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a, a fabulous piece. Again, widely knocked off. You can buy one of these pieces today. But you can see throughout the years kind of where we've been, where we're going to. Uh, our next webinar series uh, coming up, we're going to be having design trends. And that's going to be more to the last few decades. So I'm going to end this now. I want to say thank you all for being here. I know we're a minute over. Uh, I want to acknowledge Hudson Valley Lighting, uh, the National Candle Association, and Wikipedia. Uh, some of our manufacturers, Sonneman, GLLS, Dallas, Europhase, Hudson Valley, GM Lighting, Mateo, Hinkley, Z-Light, Adorn, and Kendall. These are all of our uh, decorative lighting manufacturers. You can get in touch with us through Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, or visit us on the web at catalystsales.ca.